Hi, Vivek. Hi, hi. You can hear me well? You can see my photo? Okay, you can see my, see me as well. Okay, let me see. We've got, we got people coming in. Hello, Richard, how are you doing? How are you, Anand? Ananya, Ananya is also here. Amlan, Gabriel, welcome, welcome. Welcome, Rishi, welcome, Fareen, Mitun. Good to see all of you. So many people registered, so many people walking in. Fantastic. Yeah, yeah. great to see Salil. Hello, Dr. Dr. Sen. Dr. Sen is here, right? So. Nathan, hi, Sen, how are you? Welcome. <laughs> Lovely. And, um, okay, so we'll wait for another minute or so, and then we can, we can get started. Good afternoon, Richard. Maima, how are you doing? I hope your monkey project is doing well. Hey, we got people from Borneo. Chavez is here. Good to hear. Good to see you, Chavez. Listen, Mohit, I have people coming in. Where do I see that? Anyway. Uh, if good. You're going to chat. good. Yeah, if you go into chat, then people are saying hello and uh, uh, send nothing, of course, is. Uh, is ah, okay. No, no, is no, I people of us. <laughs> Yeah, okay. Yes. Uh, good morning, Karen. We got Anand Madhbani from Nairobi. Good to see all of you. Thank you for coming. It's, it's really a pleasure to, to see you all here. Okay, so I want, we, we've got only one hour, and I don't want to uh, waste a lot of time. We will get started straight away. So I want to talk about, uh, I just want to know if everybody can hear me properly. Can you just put that in the chat if everybody can hear me properly? Can you just put Hi, Dr. And Dr. Iqbal Malik is also here. Dr. Malik, welcome. And that's uh, Maria. Um, from that, that is Marsha, yeah. who I said hi to. All right, okay, okay, excellent, okay, good. So I guess everybody can hear me now. Um, why am I doing this webinar? The goal of this webinar is to help Asian elephants as much as they can. You know, it is my life goal and my business goal as well to support Wildlife Trust of India with their elephant-related projects. In this mission, I've been lucky to have the support of a stalwart, Vivek Menon, who is at the forefront of elephant conservation. Vivek often says elephants are near persons. Their intelligence and their so social structure is so close to ours. And it really pains me to see how we can so mistreat these animals that are so close to us. And how they're losing their home when, in the name of development. Well, I believe in karma, and I know that any effort in this part of conservation will reward everyone in a big way. So I'll introduce myself first. I'm Mohit Agarwal, an experiential ecotourism specialist with deep love for nature. I help people travel to some wonderful places in Asia. I'm the founder of Asian Adventures, a 26-year-old travel company. It is the largest and number one bird watching tour company in India. The company is on a mission to help Asian elephants with their corridors with Wildlife Trust of India, free the Himalayas of plastic waste, and help small wildlife NGOs, and save the ancient Himalayan shrines. Now it's about Vivek. So most of you know Vivek. Vivek Menon is an Indian wildlife conservationist, environmental commentator, author, and photographer with a passion for elephants and birds founder of five environmental and nature conservation organizations. Hats off to you, Vivek. Menon is founder and executive director of Wildlife Trust of India. He's the author of or editor of 10 wildlife books and hundreds of articles on natural history. So if you want to know more about Vivek, uh, Gaurav, can you just paste the link 
that sort of opens the profile of Vivek so that people who want to see or want to know more about Vivek can do that at a later stage. You can paste it whenever you've got time. So Vivek, I'm going to ask you a few questions. Is that okay? Sure. Okay. So tell me what made you fall in love with elephants in the first place? And you often say it's your favorite animal. Yeah, yeah it, it, it is my favorite animal. I'll come to that in a second. I can see people uh, in the chat saying that uh, you, you said I'm an Indian conservationist, but I can see people in the chat saying that that the, the work is global. It, it is indeed. Um, but let me come to your question. Genetically, only genetically, but genetically, I'm from Kerala. And it is said that every Malayali is born in love with elephants, right? I wasn't born in Kerala. I, I didn't spend my childhood there except for five years. But perhaps it was in my genes uh, that these animals fascinated me and uh, continue to fascinate me 50 years and more since. Uh, you, you gave a clue to this, which is that you said that I often refer to elephants as near persons. And I think that is the reason I fell in love with elephants. Although the first elephants I saw, the very first elephants I saw were captive actually, were temple elephants of Kerala. Uh, and they were not perhaps the most happy elephants, nor were they the most, uh, uh, the elephants that one could idolize. But for me, they, they fascinated me as a child as I've seen many children being fascinated by, by this animal. Its eyes, the way it connects with you, its trunk, which reaches out to you. Just the size, anything big for a small child is, is marvelous and up so close. And then I went to the wild and saw them in the wild. And the fascination increased a hundred times because uh, you, you realize, as I said, that an elephant in its memory, consciousness, uh, intelligence, um, communication abilities, uh, so many things that we think as essentially human traits. They're so close to us that if I were a completely unbiased scientist who's not even human, I would say that an elephant is a person. But because I'm human and because I'm, I was born with the biases of a human, you wouldn't want to call an elephant a person. If you do that, then at least I say you should call it a near person because it is so close to us. And this is not emotive stuff. There is plenty of science which shows neurologically an elephant goes through so many things like we do, whether it's trauma or happiness or recognition or memory or even self-recognition, which they say is the ultimate test of being human. Uh, apes and elephants come very, very close to us. So, uh, you know, all, all these things fascinate me about the animal. And that's perhaps a long answer to your short question, but uh, that, that's what uh, made me fall in love with the animal and, and made me continue that love affair till today. Excellent. Well, I have my thoughts as well, which I will talk about later. And I'm going to ask you another question which is, can you describe elephant protection taken in a country since independence? And where do we stand today? I can, I can, but I won't concentrate on that because I won't concentrate on the time from independence, simply because independence was 1947. And 1947 to now, we are talking about a mat matter of 60, 70 years, is a blink in the eye of an animal that entered the Indian subcontinent uh, two and a half or three million years ago. So uh, independence is a, is a human con concept, a political concept. We must go back, I think, when we talk about the elephant. And we must go back to the times we know about it. We don't know many things perhaps before it, but we do know that, as I said, by the way, for people who don't know the Asian elephant, the progenitor of the Asian elephant, Asian elephant is Elephas maximus, but Elephas itself originated in Africa. Um, 
three million years ago and was pushed out of Africa in a sense by an emerging new genus called Loxodonta, which is the African elephant today. So that is a, a more successful genus at that stage, pushed the then elephants out. It went out of Africa, just like humans also went out of Africa, elephants also went out of Africa. Developed into the mammoth, uh, which went into, into uh, Europe. Developed into the mastodon, which went into the Americas and became extinct there, no longer up there. And that, mam that mammoth strain came and one of those came into Central Asia and modern day China and then came into India as Elephas, something else, not Elephas Maximus. Several kinds of Elephases have existed at one stage. There were 32 different elephants in India. So when you talk independence, you know, you, you, it, it's, it's so close. But there was a time when there were 32 different kinds of elephants. In India. And we know this is fossil record from the Shivaliks. And then when you ask me this question about protection, protection doesn't go back that far. We don't know. They may, may have gone back. We don't know. But we know from the Indus Valley seals that they are new elephants. We know from the Indus Valley seals that they actually uh, had tamed elephants and, and had captive elephants because we have, you know, a little saddle or a cloth seeming to be hung over the elephant even in those days. So we can safely say that uh, the tradition of uh, relationship between the, the elephant and man in India goes back a few thousand years, right? Not 60 years, 70 years, but a few thousand years. And the first bit of protection, you asked about protection. So the first bit of protection that we see really is in uh, Arthashastra, which people say was written by Kautilya or, or, or uh, 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 Chanakya. We don't know very truly whether the whole thing was written by that person, but definitely some parts of it at least were. And, and that was in the era of Chandragupta Maurya. So we're talking about the grandfather of Ashoka. We're talking about two and a half thousand years ago, approximately. And we're talking about this man who writes a whole chapter on elephants in the Arthashastra, which is a Machiavellian treatise on statecraft. It's not on wildlife. It's not on nature. It's not on anything that you may think is associated with elephant. It's on statecraft, on what makes a good king. And in, in it, he writes many things, including the fact that to defend a kingdom, you need elephants. The fact that to have elephants, you need certain kinds of forests. The fact that elephants will not procreate in places like you or me, he tells the king, oh emperor, the elephant needs certain kinds of forest. Then he describes a forest. It's like a forester. He actually describes different kinds of forest. Then he says, this kind of forest, we have elephants. Then he describes in his kingdom of Magadha, what are the forests which have those attributes? Then he says, oh, oh, king or emperor, please make these forests, may, may these forests be called Gajavanas. I'm paraphrasing, not exact words. He said, may these forests be called Gajavanas or elephant forests. Then he says, you protect them and if anybody encroaches them or cuts the trees in them or hunts elephants, you find them so much. The first laws of this country, not the Wildlife Protection Act after independence, first laws of wildlife protection. Then he says that appoint a chief elephant warden to protect these Gajavanas. And in today's recreation, which was done by Trotman in, in, in his book on elephants, as well as in Sukumar's book on elephants, there's a map in which they have redrawn Chanakya's Gajavanas. And you will see that these are the first sanctuaries, not just in India for elephants, but in India for any animal, not just in India for any animal, but in the world for any animal. And those who tell you that Yellowstone National Park is the first national park in the world should read the Arthashastra and see the, the, the meaning of protection of a, a protected area, in this case for elephants, two and a half thousand years ago. Those who say the 1800 something law on animal protection of Britain was the first law on animal protection should read this. 1800 something is not two and a half thousand years ago. Yeah. Now people will say, but it is not written. But it was written because Chandragupta Maurya's grandson Ashoka did carve those edicts, not in paper, but on rock edicts, one which stands outside my home, if you go and see. All over India, there are rock edicts, and they carve what you should do with animals. So a form of protection existed from that time, and Mohit, I really wanted to stress on this, because we keep talking about the last 60 years of protection, but it's really two and a half thousand years of some sort of protection that was afforded. 
After independence, of course, we have had um, the Wildlife Protection Act of 1972, uh, amended many times since, which has protects the elephant in many ways. Uh, and we have had uh, the Project Elephant run by central government, which protects uh, elephants through elephant reserves. And of course, we have the National Park and Wildlife uh, System, which states do, uh, in, uh, which actually protects the land in which elephants uh, are. And now with the new concept, which we will spend some time, I'm sure, talking about, uh, thinking that your next question is something I know, uh, we are trying to introduce the concept of protecting even the linkages between these protected areas and trying to protect even those lands that elephants walk, even outside protected areas. I hope that answers your question. So I think it was really important to understand the historical connection. You know, when, when we start to look at where we are going to go into the future with elephant conservation, we need to understand where, where we are coming from. Yeah. And, you know, it's, it's really important to, to join those dots as we go along. Okay, so this webinar is more about you. So I'm going to move to the third question. It's more about elephant. No, it's not about me. Hopefully. Okay, it's about the elephants. So, uh, tell us something about the right of passage and how it was identified as the most important aspect to be addressed and the work of wildlife groups of India you know, that has been done in the field so far. And I also have a presentation here. If you'd like, I can put that on and we can start with that. Sure, we can discuss this. This third topic through the presentation, I suppose. Um, so, Mohit, if you can start the presentation, I'm quite happy to lead our viewers a little bit through that. Um, now, if you can go to the very first one. I think we are somewhere in the middle of it. So, if you go all the way back. So, friends, um, uh, what more? Yeah, thank you. So, what... Um, we talked about right of passage is a term that uh, the left trust of India um, and it's the elephant family, World Land Trust, uh, and locally many other partners uh, across India, um, and Project Elephant and state forest departments came across to describe a, an, an elephant. So, before I start, what right of passage is or what corridors are or what, why we need to conserve them, you need to know what an elephant is. So, if I, if I move to what an elephant is, some, a question I ask the children if I talk to them, a question I ask parliamentarians or heads of state if I talk to them, is the same. And they often tell me the first part, which is an elephant is big, a child can. The fact that it's big or large is something that uh, causes biologically, being a mega herbivore, it's not just a word, it's a mega herbivore, a thing over a thousand kilos in size in biology. And because it's so big, it has to be what I call nomadic. And many people don't necessarily term an elephant as that. Some people term it migratory, some people say it's not migratory, non nomadic, but I like to call it nomadic. I don't think it's a truly a migratory animal at all. But it is nomadic. It does move. It moves cyclically, just like a human nomad, from place to place. Because it is large, because it needs a certain amount of food to exist, it has to move from place to place. So it's a nomad. It's also, as I told some of you, highly intelligent. Yeah, uh, a near person I just described. So it, it's a very intelligent animal. Intelligence which can be measured in scientific parameters as well. Not any motive ones alone. And it's also highly social. And as I keep like to tell people that it's matriarchal, matrilineal, like my own uh, clan, the Nairs of, of Kerala. It is a matriarchal society led by a female um, and where males stay till they are uh, teenagers and then they leave the maternal herd uh, and uh, first form loose coalitions among males and then live solitary lives and come back into not the, their, their maternal herd, but into other herds and mate and then go out again. 
So this is what an elephant is. And it's very important to know what an elephant is if you want to understand it, if you want to study it, if you want to manage it, if you want to do anything about it. Okay? Now, there are also architects. I like calling them architects because many people think elephants destroy things. And I often like to take an African example to explain this. That in the, um, in the 80s, when Savo was national park, was an unknown park of Kenya. And nobody went. People went to Masai Mara. Nobody went to Savo. People went to Amboseli. But Savo was a huge area, you know, 10 times the size of Mara or Amboseli, 20,000 square kilometers. Huge area. But people didn't go there because it was closed woods and they wouldn't see any animal. Then the elephants started tearing up Savo. And people said, oh, the elephant is destroying this forest. And there was a plan at one stage of culling those elephants. But Kenyan government ran short of money or, or whatever other political reasons. They stopped the cull. And purely for reasons the elephants did not uh, count on, they were let alone. And they actually opened up the forest. They didn't tear down the forest. They opened up the forest and grasslands took over and a certain set of animals moved in. And suddenly, Savo became the darling of tourists and everybody and politicians and everybody went there because you could see animals. Now, the elephant had created a grassland, a, 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 a mosaic savanna woodland, which it was not before. So an elephant is a creator of forests. And in this slide I've shown you, and I'm not taking you through each one of those things, how it creates forests, whether it's by its droppings or creating water holes or opening up forests. Uh, in India, and I must apologize to my non-Indian uh, Asian friends who are here, the elephant is found in 13 countries in Asia, and it's just as critical uh, to conserve them in various parts of Asia. This talk, Mohit told me, was about India, about the right of passage in India. And indeed, to talk about 50% uh, of the elephants of Asia, is now in India. No. Uh, it deserves a talk of its own. And Perhaps. But for India, we have about 30,000 elephants, give or take a few, which is about 58% of the global population. And we try to protect them in the way we have shown you on the map. Okay, In four broad populations in the Western Ghats, in Northeast India, a little bit in the Tarai, and then scattered in South Central, South East Central India. And the things that threaten them are very much the things that threaten many other animals like poaching, like conflict, but also some things which don't necessarily threaten all animals, like linear infrastructure that cut across things like roads and highways, which are so important for a nomadic animal um, that they need that right to move. Because as I told you, they're big. And as I told you, they're nomadic because it stay in one place, they'll eat that place up. So unlike a tiger reserve, an elephant reserve cannot be where the elephants stay all the time. Because unless they move out, they'll finish that resource. They have to move out, wait for this resource to regenerate, and then come back. That cyclical movement is very important. Remember when the British came first to India, they built their first road, especially in hilly terrain, on the footprints of elephants because that's the steadiest gradient they could find. Very good engineering. Right? Very bad for the elephant. And that is why we say you have to give them a right of passage, even though you have roads and rail, railways and highways, and you need more. Perhaps you do as a human civilization, but you must give them the ability to move despite your linear infrastructure. This is a thing equally important for tigers and other things, but tigers and, and big cats and uh, certain other species can move singly through a large landscape, much easier than herds of elephants can. Uh, I am not talking about it so much, but a lot of my life, my earlier life, uh, which even Mohit shared with me for some time, uh, was on anti-poaching and stopping the ivory trade. And indeed, in the early 90s, this was a thing that was threatening Indian elephants. No longer the case in in, in total, I think the right of passage, which you're talking about today largely, is the big threat. Having said that, you can never take your eyes off poaching. Elephants are killed for its ivory, very largely in Africa nowadays, but in Asia too. And we must never take our eyes off the fact in Asia because in Asia, unlike Africa, only our males have tusks. 
So what you're poaching for ivory are only males. And what you're poaching on the males are only large males. Now, what does that make? You take out the largest, fittest animal out of the population means you're becoming anti-Darwinian. This, the fittest does not survive anymore. The fittest is a target. The weak survives. So you're going to turn the entire population on its head. So it's very, very important in a conservation sense to look at poaching because that can be the straw that breaks the camel's back. But habitat and loss and fragmentation is what we're talking about. All over Asia, where there's animal ranges, 13 countries, we share habitat loss. We share the fragmentation of habitat that the elephant wants, although the elephant is such a generalist that it won't, it can even have degraded land, it can even have you know, edge forest, it can have deciduous forest, it doesn't need rainforest like lion tail macaques need or something else needs. Yeah, so it, it is it is a tolerant species, an adaptive species, but still that which it can use is being fragmented and the habitat is being lost. As you can see from, from these images, whether it's by tea gardens or it's by zoom cultivation or nomadic shifting cultivation, or it's by mines or quarries or, 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 or railways or highways. Yeah, very many factors which is fragmenting its habitat. As I said, highways and railways, some of the most visible thing, when you come from India, you open the paper or nowadays you don't, you open your mobile phone in the morning and, and read Twitter or, or Facebook or whatever. And you get images of elephants being killed by trains so often. And it pains people and there are horrendous, uh, you know, images and there are uh, horrified expressions by people saying, oh, we want this to stop, we want this to stop. But people don't realize it's not one animal dying in a pool of blood. It is a whole population being isolated into little fragments and, and, and suffering as a result. So we must look at the larger picture and react to that larger picture. Uh, recently, uh, we saw an image of an animal being killed uh, by a vehicle and there were outraged comments by people saying we must find the driver, we must stop the person who killed it in high speed. And there are only few comments and few people who realize that it's the people who lay down these tracks or these roads through such pristine forests who must also be held accountable, not just the person who sped across it because it was there, but uh, the person who, who actually plans and lays this down as a political uh, uh, fabric of the country or the people who demand it from the politician or the bureaucracy which allows it must be equally held responsible as the driver who actually hit that animal. Uh, tea, coffee is what I what I showed, uh, but any agriculture uh, which has converted large parts of our land into places like this uh, is what is uh, causing habitat to go at an alarming rate. But the other thing that really worries me is that tolerance, which we think is an Asian trait as compared to Africa, we are much more tolerant to the animal. Among Asia, we think it's a peculiarly South Asian trait, even more than Southeast Asia, because, for example, in Zimbabwe, when I visited it first, they said that uh, uh, a certain number of elephants per square kilometers was a carrying capacity, and anything above that of elephants, you could come. Because beyond that, given the human population of Zimbabwe, you could not tolerate the elephant. And it was two point something. It was a scientific paper and uh, was used in management. I forget, it's a long time ago. It's 2.5 or 2.6, something like that. Two point something. In India, in, in the Western Ghats, uh, there are parks which are four elephants, four and a half elephants a square kilometer. We call it God. We call it uh, something we want to protect. Despite the fact that 500 people a year are killed by elephants in this country. In Zimbabwe, people are not killed. And if they're killed, they're one and two. Yeah, you can count them on your fingers. So despite, so we thought tolerance was really an Asian and especially South Asian virtue, but this is eroding. As you can see in some of these images where there's people throwing tar bombs or, or flames at uh, cocktails at, um, at, at elephants 
or it's uh, people killing them and writing. In a previous image, there was an image which showed somebody scrolling. Uh, Danchor bin Laden in Assamese, which means Paddy Thief Osama bin Laden. So the the elephant, which is called Ganesha in India, yeah, which is many Hindus, and if you, even if you're not a Hindu, is respected by many tribal cultures and other cultures, being called Osama, which is just a symbol of hate. It's nothing to do with Osama bin Laden. So this change, this shift is happening as we talk, right? And this man versus elephant thing uh, is really bad. 100 elephants dead a year on the, in this, and 500 people dead. Actually, elephants are winning in this currently. Can't last for long. Man will win if it goes on this way. The, the game of attrition is happening. Okay. So corridors are what connects these habitats. It's very important for gene flow. It also is important for that individual animal that goes. Uh, and there are all these threats to corridors that I've talked about. I don't need to take you through all of them. But when we analyzed the corridors 15 years ago as the Wildlife Trust of India and brought out the first book called Rite of Passage, more than 15 years ago now, uh, these were the things that we figured out. Uh, it even gives you percentages of corridors that are threatened by various threats. Okay, And when we did that 15 years hence, uh, a few years ago, in the second edition, we found that seven of the identified corridors, which were at that stage 88, have gone in those 15 years. As we talked about it, they've gone, right? Meanwhile, new ones have come. So the 88 corridors that we had identified 15 years ago is today 101 corridors. And it's ironic that people sometimes call me to congratulate and say, oh, you have more corridors. No. No, we should be weeping because if the fact that we have more corridors means we have less habitat, means we need more connections, means the main habitats are getting fragmented. So more corridors is bad. Longer corridors is bad. We need fewer, shorter corridors. That's what we want. So anyway, now we have 101 connections between fragmented habitat that the Wildlife Trust of India is desperately trying to protect along the state line and the central line. And these are the legal ways we have been advising the states. And, uh, now, the fact of recognizing them, many states have done. And the fact that we have put up boards along with state government and central government has happened. The word corridor is now in elephant conservation parlance. Everybody uses it. States use it. Center uses it. Supreme Court uses it. There have been a few landmark judgments recently in Tamil Nadu based on corridors. But nobody was talking corridors 20 years earlier, 15 years earlier, when we started talking about this. So I'm very, very happy that that has happened. But have states actually done all these six or seven things that we've prescribed? No. And it's been patchy. So we need to keep working with them. We need to keep uh, prompting them. We need to keep encouraging them. We need to keep helping the government do these things, which we are trying to do. And just not telling them, but we've shown them how to do it. And we have shown four different models. I'm not going to great detail, but we have purchased land and give it into a national park in Kerala, where we purchased land around Wayanad by last century and gave it, and it's now a protected area. After relocating people, it takes 15 years to relocate a village properly, but we've done that. We've done community securement models over uh, thousands of hectares in Garo Hills in Meghalaya. Uh, and that's a very, 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 uh, valuable uh, model where we don't own land, the government doesn't own land, the community owns land, keeps the land, but keeps aside some part for elephants. We've done the government acquisition model uh, in Rajaji, uh, not fully successful, but at least in terms of the one village and, and also the railway and highway we have been successful to some extent. And the rest of the corridors, not all corridors need acquirement or securement or something, but we need people around the corridor to want to protect that land because it's outside protection. You don't need to make everything in this park. We just need right of passage. We don't need the animal to be killed while they move from one to the other. For that, we have this Green Corridor Champion, a wonderful scheme of uh, you know uh, um, non-governmental organizations and individuals across India who have been identified for particular corridors. And they do awareness, they do community work, they mobilize the local government, 
they mobilize the local people and stop from a small thing like elephants crossing a road and there's traffic coming, they'll stop the traffic and allow the elephants to cross the road. From that small thing to a larger thing, that lobbying the local government to say that, hey, we need a really safe. So we have done many, many things. I'm not uh, dwelling on each one of these, because each one of these is on, on various different projects. But as I said, to me, the Green Corridor Champions, which work in all the 101 corridors, rather than the ones which we do on one corridor at a time, is the most important thing. At the moment, we have 27 organizations which are already on board, uh, actively protecting 50, 60 corridors of India. We need more. So any of you hearing this who are near a corridor of India, who wants to protect, get in touch with us. because we, And we'll come to that uh, at the end of the talk as well, how we can help. But really, if you are if you are a local champion and you are on this, and you're not in Suffolk or Surrey, then this is the way to help. If you are near an elephant corridor. If you are in Suffolk or Surrey, we'll tell you another way to help. Okay. Um, we have been doing uh, a lot of biological monitoring, doing good science to find out, are these corridors changing? Are the elephants still using them? Are other wildlife using them? That's very important. Don't think, I'm saying elephant, but the same corridors are used by tiger. The same corridor is used by frogs, the same corridors are used by several land ungulates. So anything that requires terrestrial movement, uh, we're using also elephants as a flagship. Elephant for itself needs these connections very much so, but the elephant as a flagship will provide that connectivity for a plethora of animals which may not have the charisma for which we will protect. We may not protect a connection between two national parks for frogs. We may not do that for a small mouse deer, but we will do it for an elephant or a tiger. And so we use that as a flagship. Uh, the other thing we started out a few years ago, unfortunately a small break on it because of COVID, mm -hmm. but I don't think, I think it's a small break. I think it's a temporary break. But really when I was part of the Elephant Task Force of the government of India a few years ago, one of the things that we came upon and we said it is that we really need to take Gaja or Ganesha or the elephant to the Praja, to the people of India, Praja citizenry. So using two Sanskrit words of Gaja and Praja, which rhyme. So Gaja being the elephant to the citizenry. And eventually we want the citizenry of the country to recognize. The same elephant task was recommended and the government accepted and the elephant was made the national heritage animal of India. The national animal of India is the tiger. For those of you who are not from India, who are on this webinar. But we created a new clause called National Heritage Animal, for something that connects people to wildlife, which is the elephant. But it's all very well to call it a National Heritage Animal in, in governmental schemes. It will remain just as archaic as any of our museums or mausoleums, unless we bring it to the people, unless that connect is there. So we try to do that by taking art pieces of elephants. 101 elephants were created by well-known artists and lesser-known artists, but local artists. Life-size elephant pieces, beautiful pieces, and these were then taken through India in a show of strength as if they were coming to the capital, Delhi. And then we had this massive festival in Delhi uh, last year, in um, the year before, actually, already more than a year. Uh, in Delhi for a whole week, where these 101 art pieces were exhibited in a large uh, central part of New Delhi and politicians and bureaucrats and children and uh, technical people, as well as uh, artists and dancers and sculptors and painters, all came, and musicians, they all came, celebrated the animal and talked about it scientifically and, and found ways to tackle the problem uh, of uh, man-elephant conflict, of uh, right of passage. And we hope that this would then spread across India. And we have done it in a few states since. As I said, a temporary break because of Corona. Hopefully we'll get back to it. So in doing all this, friends, uh, we, are, we are hoping that we'll connect the elephant populations again, or at least within those elephant populations. We may not ever be able to connect Western Ghats to Central India, like they try to do in Africa, because they still have vast swathes of lands without people in Africa. Unfortunately, we don't have that that um, uh, privilege in India, but we are trying to connect at least within those populations. 
so they don't get further fragmented. And like this visual shows, we're trying to make sure that the elephant is not stranded on a rooftop. This is not a, a um, you know, a fake image. This is an animal in uh, in uh, Kurdwar uh, in Uttarakhand who has moved along its right its passage and found that it's on the roof of a house. It has not climbed the house. It, elephants cannot climb a, a wall of a building. It has gone across its natural gradient, its not, natural path, but somebody has built a house from the bottom up, right? So this is what we're doing to our animals uh, in India and in many parts of Asia. I'm, as I said, I'm at the moment talking about India, but I'm sure a lot of it will resonate with my viewers in Malaysia or Indonesia or Thailand or, or Sri Lanka. Um, and uh, what we need to do is to ensure that not only are the core habitats of the animal protected and they're protected from poaching, etc., but that these little strips of land that connects them are protected. So Wildlife Trust of India and its partners internationally as well as nationally through the Green Corridor Champions, uh, as well as the governments, whether it's uh, the Project Elephant and state governments, are all working for the same aim. And, uh, and we would welcome at the end of this talk and or others for anybody tuning in to assist and help us uh, reach this goal of finishing 101 corridors. Okay, I have finished 35 years in the field of conservation, uh, 15 years of this particular project. Before I retire, not very soon, I can, I can uh, guarantee you that, but um, I, I would like that this project of securing the future of Asian elephants is done and I would be, I would welcome any help that any one of you can give uh, to assist us. You can help us if you are near the corridors or near habitats by actually doing work on ground, joining our Green Corridor champions and helping protect elephants. You can help us if you have any political connections or bureaucratic connections to do advocacy and bring about policy changes, bring about real changes on ground uh, to help elephants. If you have any, or you're working for your, or have any connection in any linear infrastructure agency, highways, roadways, railways, electric lines, anything, you can help by within your own corporations or government departments to bring change. And in doing so, helping elephants, to helping Ganesha in India and to set precedents for other countries to also follow. So I don't think if you do it in India, it's only for India. Uh, remember we have 58% of the elephants. That's not just something to boast about, but it's something to be responsible about. And so we have to set that trend. If you're not in any of these positions, then assist by giving money. Yeah, donate to either securing these corridors or donate to any of these green corridor champions so that each one of them can protect some corridors by themselves. Small amounts of money can help small organizations do great jobs. If you have large amounts of money or access to large amounts of money, assist in, in securing a corridor. Unfortunately, in countries like India with 1.2 billion people, it's not cheap anymore to buy land. But Mark Twain, paraphrasing, perhaps he didn't say it, just like Chanakya perhaps he didn't write that, just that people have said that he has not said it. But what I've heard is Mark Twain said, that when you see land, grab it, they ain't making it no more. So what I would like to leave my own children in life is land or a house in a land with 1.2 billion people, there's no space. What I'd like to leave elephants is land. So if you have the ability of setting aside some land, do that because that will last forever. Uh, if you don't help, as I said, in any one of these ways uh, and more, which we can go into in greater detail, I want to end the, end the presentation and ask Mohit if he wants to ask me anything more. Thank you. This was absolutely brilliant. And thank you for sharing. This is information. It sort of makes my stand more strong. You know, as I go along to work for electric conservation. Like I said, it's my life goal, but it's also my business goal. And I want to make sure that the tourism body of tourism departments or tourism operators have to promise 
for you know a lot of these countries do not even have like and if i can sort of get them to appreciate the cause of conservation of animals you know half my job is done because when they can we can be really sensible when they send the tourists out to these places and we can sensitize them and we don't know what's going to emerge from there so my <clears throat> my next question to you was uh, the same like you said how are we going to contribute to building the corridors or habitat of how people can be involved and then give options in terms of money or talking about cause or volunteering or research or internships so i think you already discussed that i am going to share a file which i uh which i have for everyone that clearly states how you can help and it's got context of my left trust of it well and you can go ahead and share uh you know you can share it with those people who are interested and they can do a lot with that document it's just a six page document download this file right and then later a few hours later when you get the replay of this entire presentation you get this file link as well and um, now there are people sure. asking questions uh, uh, vivek would you like to answer i'll go so i need to read the question somewhere on on chat yeah uh, okay. yeah it's All on right. the chat let me, let me go on so, chat and try to try to find the uh, question but if i if, if i forget uh, mohit i really want to thank you and uh, thank you in adventures um, i mean i i can do that at the end of the talk but what i want to thank you now is because you you are are telling people to help but you have set the president yeah you have set the president of a private uh, uh, company uh, coming to protect elephants Uh, and i really think people should follow this lead not just the individuals but as corporations and uh, and businesses uh, obviously uh, mr mutagwal and his ventures finds that it is in the best interest of all of us as human beings as businesses uh, to to support in a sustainable world and uh, i i really think i i want to thank him anyway and and and, uh, and those of you who wish to follow his his so should also do so and knowing that it is a good business practice as well not just charitable practice but now i'll i'll i'll, I'll try to read some of these questions uh, if i so somebody harpreet kaur asks which is the largest elephant corridor in india there will be somewhere in jharkhand i don't know which is the largest because i am not the guinness book of world records not the limca book of world records but it's one of those uh, in central india but remember i told you what is the largest that should not concern you as being something good huh? it's something bad uh, and because of habitat in in that area of jharkhand chatisgarh orissa tri junction is probably the most fragmented of elephant habitats some of the longest corridors are there please don't take it as largest and good um how is the indian elephant distinct from other asian elephants what an interesting question that is because most people ask how is indian elephant uh, distinct from the african elephant and that's very distinct okay very very different genuses as i said um, and i even told you for example that the indian elephant the asian elephant the males have tusks whereas and not even all males have tusks whereas in african elephants males and females have tusks for example so there, there are many differences between them now the indian elephant is not necessarily genetically very different from other mainland asian elephants they are all asian elephants okay but we know that the island elephants are slightly different we know that the bornean elephant for example is a different being we know that the sumatran elephant for example is a different being and we know that the sri lankan elephant for example is a different being so when you separate it as an island over a period some changes accumulate evolutionarily over time and at the moment we call two of them the sumatran and the sri lankan elephant as subspecies okay and the other asian mainland as one subspecies the bornean elephant is still under debate and we have just held a meeting of a year and a half ago uh, where we have started the process of recognizing uh, that also as a distinct uh, being so uh, so that that that's a, a long answer to a short question i suppose 
Um, now, the problem with making me read this is I need my specs, which shows you that I've done this for 35 years. Um, yeah, there are people from Sri Lanka commenting that it's interesting for them. And I worked in Sri Lanka as well. Uh, many years ago, I came to translocate your elephants from Anuradhapura, and that was a great uh, thing that I did along with another Indian conservationist, Ajay Desai, who unfortunately passed away a few months ago, and I must pay homage to him as well. He was a great Asian elephant conservationist, um, Indian of origin, but worked in Sri Lanka and worked in Indonesia and worked all over Asia. But in Sri Lanka, I did a bit of work with him. Um, Do we have pygmy elephants in India? And no, we don't. And in fact, we don't have pygmy elephants anywhere. So people think, uh, for example, the Bornean elephant, people call it a pygmy elephant. No, it's not a pygmy elephant. If you know what pygmy elephants are, if you want to know what pygmy elephants are, go to the um, London Museum of Natural History um, and go and see the fossil uh, records there and you'll see little teeth, this small. The molars. The molars of extant elephants which are living today are this big, this small. Those are pygmy elephants. And they did live in parts of Europe, in Crete and in parts like that, uh, many uh, tens of thousands of years ago. At the moment, we don't have pygmy elephants anywhere. There are some smaller ones, there are some bigger ones that are not pygmy. Okay. Uh, do I see any more questions? There's a lot of chat, but uh, I don't see too many questions. Uh, Folks, if you have questions, please bring it to the top of the thing. Uh, yeah, I do see now something at the top. Do you have specific information on the health of the local population in what is now Mundantre Kalakad? Okay, where we worked there almost 50 years ago with BNHS. Yes, Steve, I remember that work. Elephants were common. Uh, and sorry, I didn't see the last bit of your uh, But in the culinary domain. Anyway, uh, so Steve, yes, indeed, you, you, your work was one of the pioneering works in southern India. Um, and uh, yes, we have some uh, information on the status, if you say health of local population, I presume you mean status of the population. And yes, we have uh, information and they're very much there. Um, and uh, not undergoing perhaps as many pressures as uh, the, the the more populated parts of uh, southern India has. So that, that is the good news I can give you. Um, Okay, Johnny Kamugisha says at some point you mentioned a certain number of kinds of elephants. So these are extinct elephant, elephantoids or ele elephant or proboscideans species. They're not modern elephants. Okay, they're not El Elephas maximus, the Asian elephant. They're not Loxodont africana, the African elephant. But there were many things like Stegodon, Ganesha. I'm just giving one example. Yeah. Uh, several species of Elephas itself or Stegodon or other genuses which existed. And at some stage, there were over 30 of them uh, roaming what is today uh, modern day India. That's what I meant. Yeah, there's some people saying that Ajay was a dear friend. Uh, indeed, he was a dear friend to so many people. Uh, there's Nishant asking any books you can suggest if you need to know more about the history of wildlife conservation. There's one by Mahesh Rangarajan. Um, if you're talking about history of wildlife conservation in India, I'm presuming you are, uh, because you're asking that. In an Asian sense, I don't see a book which can actually tell you of all of Asia. But uh, Mahesh Rangarajan's history uh, is, I suppose, the only sort of history we have for Indian wildlife conservation. Uh, Salil asks, if there's any invasive or feral animals that are threatening elephants in any way, not that I know of. Not really. Uh, Chavez, hi Chavez. Uh, you say China is investing a lot of money in the new Silk Road initiative. Does it go through India as well? No, it doesn't. Regardless, it goes through India or not. Once it's completed, will it affect elephant poaching even more? Will it create more pressure? So I don't know what poaching, but obviously it increases access, right? So wherever it goes through wildlife habitat, you will have pressure. It could also include poaching, but it could also include many other kinds of pressure. Um, and wherever there is it, the Chinese Silk Road or any road, but if you're talking about a major road like this one is, going through any major biodiversity or wildlife area, you are asking for trouble. 
um, and be very careful. At the moment, this particular one doesn't go through India now. Um, Gaurav, you say some tribal communities have worked with elephants for many generations. Do you think they should stop these traditional practices, whatever for? If you are saying that they have worked with elephants and if it is good, they must continue these practices. Um, there are some practices uh, which uh, are no longer culturally acceptable. For example, the practices of catching elephants and taming them for making them captive. Okay. It may still have limited use because we need people who know how to catch elephants when we need to treat them or we may need people who know how to catch elephants uh, for other management purposes, but not no longer to keep them captive, according to me. Uh, and you would say, but they have worked many years. Yes, yes. India has many traditions which are many years old. Sati is one of them, burning our widows on, on funeral pyres of their husbands who died in war. We don't do it anymore. So there are many things that society has to outmore. And it's not because I say it or you say it, but as a whole, society should outmore. I'm presuming our laws of today are a reflection of our society's need. And if you outmore them, then I don't think those traditions should be followed. But if there are tribal communities who work with, who have traditions which we can use in today's day and age, they most, most certainly should be encouraged to keep up. Do we have all the migration routes in India mapped? Yes, sir. Uh, as I said, right of passage maps all the corridors of elephant uh, nomadicity uh, or local migration. I can't call it a true migration, but yes. So the corridors are all mapped, if that's what you're asking. Bhuvan, how bad are invasive plants like lantana for elephants? Uh, not much, because elephants just go through them. Uh, they don't eat them, but they're not terribly bothered unless lantana is taking away what they want to eat. Now, elephants need both browse and graze. People don't realize this. They need grass and they need trees. They're not purely grazers, they're not purely browsers. They're more browsers than grazers, but they do need grass as well. So if grass is taken away by lantana, uh, then that's bad, okay? But lantana itself or any one plant in itself is not the issue. Okay. Do elephants like to interact and be close to people? That's an interesting question. Um, elephants like to interact and be close to their own kind. They're very, very communicative and very, very interactive and very social with their own. If they don't have their own, uh, and I'll be controversial in saying so, because some people may say I'm not right, but I think if they don't have their own, they do like to interact with human beings. They like to interact with other social beings. They like to interact with other beings that communicate. It may not only be human beings, maybe it's other animals too. But we have many examples that they have, they communicate with us and they uh, try to interact with us in some way or other, wild elephants too. Captive elephants, 100%. They're greatly dependent on, on human beings once you're captive and they do communicate and they do interact with you. Okay. Um, Mohit, you can tell me when to stop, huh? otherwise I'm going on. Sorry, by, by mistake I muted you, Vivek, you need to unmute yourself. For how many hours have you muted me, Mohit? <laughs> One. We've got one more minute. Let's take one more question, Vivek. Yeah, so Sen's question about how, how I would see global Asian elephant population faring. I'm an optimist, Sen. So I think, I think it will still be around. Yeah? And it will definitely be around if you are there and people like you are there in Borneo. And it will definitely be around if people like me are there uh, in India or Asia. So as long as we are fighting for it, we can keep it alive. Uh, it is an embryo. Thematic, charismatic species that people like also. So although there are troubles, I'm optimistic that we'll keep it. Okay. Why why is Dr. Sen asking this question? He knows that while he's there, elephants are there. So you know, there is no question about new elephants will be part of By the way, scene. Uh, just one more well, just one more question. Mahima is asking a very important question that shouldn't yeah, plantation yeah. be part of the stakeholders. Of course they are. And they are. And, and we are talking to them. North Bengal, they have been 
excellent work by Naxalbari uh, Estate uh, and Sonia, uh, bringing all these plantation owners together, and we are also bringing them together. And not just there, in other parts of India as well. Very much part. So that was that was absolutely brilliant, um, Vivek. And thank you for taking the time to join us today. I know that all of you have deep love for nature. And loving nature also includes appreciating those who work hard to preserve it. I'd once again like to thank Vivek and show my deep appreciation for the amazing work he and his team has done for elephants. I hope their work and this webinar has, has inspired you to work harder towards all that you love and help you learn more about how conservation works. This is going to be um, this is going to be recorded and it's going to be sent again to you. Do keep it uh, with you. You know, this is something that you can empower people with. This conversation is of deep meaning to all of us. So, so, so keep it with you. And if you ever need this. Again, I'm just a phone caller. Thank you, Vivek. This was absolutely wonderful. Thank you for being here. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Mohan. And thank everybody and for coming. And, thank, and, and I hope all of you will interact and, and uh, contribute. Great. So these questions, uh, the, the, the unanswered ones are going to come to me. And at some point of time, I'm going to ask you to, to talk about these and then send them the answers. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.